Communism is evil. Commun commun whether, and socialism is just a nice way of saying communism. Come on, man. You know, this is, this is, it's wicked, it's evil. All the socialist, cultural Marxist stuff, is, I feel like swearing, but it's rubbish that's coming into our country and coming into the West. Mandate. Uh, Father, we pause to give you the glory and honour that you alone deserve. As the psalmist says in Psalm 113, verse 3, from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. And so we thank you for the brothers and the sisters that are in this work and, and doing this critical, important work for our communities. Lord, we commit this time to you, and above all, pray that you would be glorified. But as, the, as Moses says in Psalm 90 as well, let the favor and the grace of our Lord rest upon us. Establish the work of our hands. Yes, Lord, establish the work of our hands. Lord, would you establish the work of this podcast and the work of this podcast and the work of the Mandate family for your glory and for the betterment of our communities. So we pray this in the wonderful, matchless and glorious name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. Amen. 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 Oh, thanks for letting me pray. Oh, no. Thank you. Thank you for praying for us for tonight. Yeah. So, yeah, are we good to go? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Hey, guys, welcome to Mandate, uh, the very first episode of 2022. And so we have here tonight with us an amazing guest. And so I'm not going to say too much about him. We're going to get him to introduce himself and tell us a little bit about himself before we kind of get into the conversation tonight. And so please put your hands together, brothers, for Ronji Tarielu. Oh, that's, I like the sound effects, Shucks. Thank you, brothers. <laughs> thank you, thank you. My Lord, so full, my langi mama. Um, praise the Lord. It's a blessing to be uh, here with you, uh, men and brothers. And uh, quickly, my name is Ronji Tanyelu, born in Samoa, uh, part Tokelauan, part Samoan, but raised in the capital of the universe, which is Mangili in South Auckland. So please don't hold that against me and send all hate mail to Petia after that. But um, yeah, just really blessed to be here, married to a beautiful Samoan uh, woman from West Auckland. Her name is Rapina. Uh, we've just, we moved back to New Zealand a couple of years ago. We were serving as Christian missionaries in parts of Africa and parts of Asia. And then uh, we came back to save some money. And then the Koviki took over and blocked us in, our, in this country. So anyway, we're blessed to be here. So thanks for having me also. Wow. No, thank you. Thank you for coming on, on tonight also. But just off the bat also, because I know you, we, we do want to unpack a little bit uh, about more of your journey and, and more of your life, um, Ranji. But um, I, I kind of read um, early on that you were a, a, a six, what, six siblings? You're the youngest yep, of six. Youngest siblings, of six, yep. And you were born in Samoa, but raised up in, uh, like you said, in Mangele. But I'm just wondering, also just to put it out there, because what was it like for you as, as a youngster growing up, you know, limited English, didn't know anything about... New Zealand, coming away into this new um, land or country, but just a little bit, if you can give us a little bit about how it was for you kind of growing up in Mangili in this new world. Yeah, I did mention it was the capital of the universe. I just want to mention that again. But I think um, also uh, we were part of that second or third wave of migration that came to New Zealand. So we came here in 81 wow. when I was about uh, almost four years old. And so you're right, came here with no English. Uh, we had all the risk factors that academics talk about. We, had the, we grew up in the state house. We had 20, 30 people at home. Uh, but we didn't know it was overcrowding until the Balangis told us it was. And so... <laughs> Um, we, we grew up in those risk factors. There was alcohol, there was abuse, there was violence, there was everyone wanted to be a G, everyone, you know, and, and that stuff was at home in my backyard, but also uh, in my community and around our neighborhood as well. So to be honest, also, I love Mangele. Yeah. I love my neighborhood and my community, but there's a bunch of stuff I hate as well. And I think about the crime, the violence, the domestic violence, some of the things the gangs do. And so I guess growing up in that, in that neighborhood, you learn to understand... Um, the, the, sort of the, the, the challenges that are in mm. our society and in our communities. But at the same time, also, I learned not to blame the system. Wow. I wow. think I, I see a lot of young people today, they're sort of growing up thinking that we're growing up in Compton or something like that. And I think, <laughs> and look, that if that's your story, that's your story. But I, I grew up, I understood that there was violence and there was gangs and drugs and abuse happening at home and around me. But my mum and my dad taught me really strongly, even though we were poor, even though we, we struggled through with the fat love love life, the religious life, the living in South Auckland life, we didn't want to blame the system. We didn't want to say that it was the Balangi's fault uh, for putting us there. And so we, we, our faith kept us going, but also um, the, the pathway to education kept us going. Oh, and wow. I think that's where 
um, that's where why my parents brought us from Samoa, the beautiful lands of Samoa, to to give us a chance in education and in employment. And so it was a it was a it was a struggle, but I think it was a struggle that a lot of us went through in that generation. Mm. And I think of 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 the fact that our people have been here since the 40s or 50s with no English, limited English, mm. working in the warehouses, manufacturing jobs. Yeah, they bought houses, started businesses. They 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 they. they it's their immigrant story. And I think um, that that's part of that story that we joined in in that second, third wave of immigration from the Pacific in the 80s. So uh, a challenging upbringing, had some fun parts as well, uh, some dumb parts as well, um, some really dumb parts as well, but by the grace of God, still alive and still really proud to come from South Auckland, come from Mangele, but know there's a lot of things that we need to fix in our communities uh, and in our families as well. Man, that's so cool, um, Bronji. I love the fact that you talked about the struggle because even now so, there's a lot of folks out there who are still struggling in, in terms of blaming the system. Mm. Um, and what are your thoughts? Because um, what, what, do you do, what do you say to those who are, or men in particular, who are kind of still like, no, no, it's the system. It's the system's fault. It's the white man's fault. You know, it's, 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 it's because it's that, that system that's kind of holding us down and we become victims. Become victims. What, what, what do you say to that, Ranji? What, what could you say to uh, um, to change the narrative for our, our, our men or our, our people? I think part of it is the battle between collective and personal responsibility. I think we grew up knowing that there was parts that we were collectively responsible with in terms of the system, the society that we lived in. But my parents ingrained us in, in us the fact that actually there were things that we were personally responsible for. And I think that's the battle that happens in society and politics where is it the system's fault we were collectively responsible or is it my fault because I made a dumb decision? And so I guess the challenge that I'd like to give to men, especially to our fathers and our husbands and um, our uncles and um, I think that might be my um, my my, uh, my wife's that's calling that's all good hey but I think part of the challenge there is that um, there's no perfect system yeah. hey we live in a, a broken true. fallen world where there's wickedness and evil and sin what I what I believe is the root of all of that brokenness in the system and so because there's no perfect system we need to understand how do we function within that system how do we wow. learn to challenge that system how do we not blame that system but actually um, make this as many good decisions as possible to try and um, and and improve and, th and thrive as men and thrive in our families so I think it's a bit of both to be honest I think there's an understanding that there's parts of the system we need to try and challenge and fix my role um, my current job is, is involved in a lot of that at the moment but at the same time there's things that are that we are personally responsible for that we need to own as people and as a community that that isn't the white man's fault that isn't based on because everyone is racist i don't yeah, i think yeah, that's yeah. a complete fallacy it's cool it isn't based on the fact that because i think the danger with that also is that it keeps us in our tribes you Islanders stay here, you Sangers stay here, you Palangi stay here, and it keeps us tribal and warring against each other. Where actually, when, when these things keep dividing us, it doesn't actually bring people together and wow. work out what's beautiful, what's wonderful, and fighting for what's true and right, not necessarily just hating on each other because we're saying that everything is racist mm. and you're a racist mm. because you disagree with me. Or you, wow. you know, so I think there's a, a whole lot of that kind of stuff, but I think the challenge f that I would give is that again, Understand the difference between what's personal and what's collective mm. responsibility and understand what it means to not blame the system. Maybe try and influence the system, yeah. change yeah. the system yeah. where we need to, but there is no perfect system. Yeah. Wow, Man. that's powerful. It's quite a paradigm shift in what we're used to hearing. Mm. Mm. Like um, trying to challenge the system and uh, the system was set up for us to be like this. So it's sort of give it the outworking of um, how we live and how we challenge the stuff is like it's always against mm. a certain group against you know everyone's against us and so yeah I really um yeah I really yeah. like enlightened in terms of what you've just shared um on the table and um yeah thank you also this yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah yeah that's a really good point it sort of made me think about um sometimes and I feel like I've been guilty of this myself um when you know sometimes i feel like we need something to blame and maybe that's something we've sort of fallen into in the modern day is um, we need someone to blame or something to blame in this case the system for things not working out the way that we want them to and sometimes we feel like the only options are overthrow the system or you're it's you're sort of one or the other there's no sort of in between and so you, you talked a really good point about um you know you can acknowledge that the system is flawed, but you can work toward finding ways to fix it. And we had an incident um, just a couple of days ago where 
Um, and it just triggered in what you were saying is, is some young people had crashed their car into a power pole outside our house. And so for a few hours, we had no power whatsoever. Just it went like that. And um, it made me realize just how much I rely on power and the system mm. that we have in place. Mm. Chorus came and fixed everything and, and Victor and all that sort of stuff. But as much as I complain about the prices of power and all these other superficial things, at the end of the day, I'm... I need all of I need the system that we have in place now to be able to function and contribute to society. Um, so it's really interesting dynamic in terms of acknowledging that the system is flawed, but how can you assess collective versus personal choice and make a difference? Yeah, mm. and I think part of that too also is the fact that you know when someone people often challenge me, what about systemic racism? Hey, the whole mm. system is racist. Mm. I actually, I, my response to them is actually, I don't think the whole system is racist, but I do believe parts of the system might be. I do believe that there's probably people who are racist, but mm. that's not racism. Racism isn't the be or end or problem in our society. I think there's numerous other problems. We think about family harm. We think about suicide. You think about the housing issues. But every time it, we're so obsessed with race, mm. and I can't stand. It in, in, in our country, like we lived overseas and worked in different mission fields with Africans and Asians, and just uh, just a wonderful experience of being with other people from other cultures that were different from mine. But here we come back to New Zealand, we're so obsessed with race, and that race seems to be the thing that that dominates everything. Mm. And I don't understand that. I think actually what we should be looking at is the integrity and the character and the values of a person rather than their skin color. Mm. And I think that's we're so obsessed. We're so caught up with, I need to own my, I'm a victim of this because I'm brown. Actually, I'm not, I don't want to be a victim. Hmm. I don't want to be a victim because I grew up in all the, the risk factors that academics tell me, the state house, the gangs, the drugs. I don't care about that stuff. Yeah, we came through that stuff, but I didn't come through that stuff necessarily because I was Samoan. I came through that stuff because there were other circuit breakers um, that helped me break through some of those cycles. Doesn't mean mm. I hate being Samoan. Doesn't mean I hate being from Mangeli. What I'm saying is I just don't get this obsession, over-obsession in our nation with race where we should be looking at the character of a man rather than their skin color or even their background or or whatever. But we, we, we look at the external, not mm. the internal of a man. And that's what I disagree with. <laughs> but what, what do you think that that's the case, um, Ronji? Because you're right. I think we're absolutely obsessed with race and and the color of our skin and, and so forth. And we kind of you know we're looking at the the clusters or you know especially with Pacifica people, clusters and rural communal. Um, but why? Why do you think is, is it? Because I know you, you. I know you got two degrees in in, uh, in politics. But is it don't say that, yeah, bro. Then, yeah, <laughs> then all, the, all the labor people might start attacking yeah, yeah. me. Then the national will come later. Yes, yeah, sure, yeah. there we go. But I want us to kind of delve, uh, kind of delve into that because. Why? What, what? What do you think needs to change for us to say? You know what? I don't want to be a victim. Yeah, I'm. I'm. A, I'm a brown. I'm brown. I'm proud. But what? What's, what do you think it's going to take for us as a, as a people, as a nation, or more so as, as Pacifica, to say? You know, what? I need to cut this. I need to. I need to. I need to wake up to something. I need to do something that's going to really um, be life changing. What, what? What do you think needs to happen for us as a people? Yeah, th th I mean. I've sort of spent my whole life trying to work through that kind of question, <laughs> to be honest. I'm 43 years old and I'm still struggling with the answer. So your life has led to this yeah, moment. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then he's put me on the spot. And oh, then sorry. This no, is the 64,000 years. No, no, no. I think, I think that is a, a critical question. But I guess it comes back to some of the things that I've already said before, to stop blaming someone else yeah. about my issues and about my problems, to block, stop blaming this this um, ethereal, this kind of straw man, balangi man that is evil, that is wrecking my life to stop blaming someone else about my issues, you know? And I think, um, and then again, that's the personal responsibility that my parents drilled into me. Yep, some parts of the system are dumb, but you make your own decisions to get some stuff done. So I think, you know, there's, look, Pacifica people, are facing massive challenges. I get that, you know, I, I work in this stuff every day. I look at the numbers, our numbers suck. Our, when we look at housing, addictions, mm -hmm. welfare, our numbers are actually absolutely terrible. But they've been terrible for a long time. So we, I think we need to understand as a people, what are we, why are these numbers the way they are? Is it, and, and ask ourselves, 
some really honest questions about what it means to bring change or what I like or what I like to call disruption to some of these to some of these statistics and is it things the way that our culture is designed is it things the way that our churches that look now we're touching some touchy whoa, subject whoa, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> ding 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 hey is it is it things the way that fat love and love is it done is, is it things the way that we I, I don't know I'm still trying to work through that as a Samoan Tokelau and man but what I'm saying is I think we need to own some of these issues ourselves which I think we are generally we are and we need to understand that we can work through some of the solutions ourselves we don't need we can join with others to help us but we but what we need to i think firstly own stop blaming um uh, uh the system or whoever the enemy might be for that day but actually work to some really good solid solutions that will help bring out and i guess the other thing i'd add to is what is the actual change that we want to see what is the real impact? You, you need to define the terms. What are we actually really? Is it is it is it economic prosperity? Is it well being in our families? Is it um, spiritual health? I we we need to understand what is the actual change that we want, and then try and work towards it rather than just almost sit in our statistics mm. and then sort of wallow in it and actually not move from there. And look, that's been pretty extreme because I know that we as a people are thriving, are tr trying our best to move in some of these things, but. I think there's also parts where, uh, let me be bold enough to say that we are at fault to ourselves as people. We need to own some of that stuff. We need to understand some of that stuff and we need to change those things firstly. And I think maybe it's a mindset change, a worldview change. Maybe it's trying to understand what we truly want to uh, see, uh, the impact that we really want to see and then really try and move towards it. So I think it's, I mean, that's my, I don't know if it's a simple answer also, but... <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it's my response is based on a lot of different things going on in my head that don't make sense, bro. So what happens when you've been knocked out several times, things sort of um, don't always make line up. But yeah, that's my response. Also. Oh, man, it's oh, cool. It's so cool, man. Ronji. Um, because you, you, it seems like you're quite fortunate and you're really, really um, very blessed in terms of your dad because you're saying your, your dad said, hey, we're not going to blame anyone. We're not going to blame the system. This is how we're going to do it. We're, gonna, we're not going to be victims. We're just going to be successful. We're just going to work hard on it and so forth. Is that because of of that era? Because it seems like in the, in the era, you know, uh, second or first uh, generation who migrated to New Zealand, they were they were they put their heads down, they were just bums up, and they just just worked, and it was near. I never heard like oh racism, racism, racism. Yeah, I think that generation was next level. And let me be honest, look, I had a hard relationship with my dad. My dad was a hard, hard man. Mm. And so all the sons struggled with that. Yeah. So well, I'm not trying to paint a picture like we were the um, we were the, the neighbor's family or, you know, like we were some perfect family. We had massive issues. And so my dad was a hard man and it was a hard relationship with his sons. But I think coming back to your point around that generation, in Samoa we talk about that word ake. Hey, that mm. word ake, which means courage, yeah, hey, or like yeah, a courage, look, or yeah. like your 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 guts to get yeah. something done. That generation that came in, you know, the first and second and third waves of of immigration from the Pacific, they had a next level mm. um, form of ake of courage. Like I said, no English. Yeah. Hey, yeah. working in the in the manufacturing jobs, warehousing jobs, bought houses, started businesses, put their school their kids through school, sent their kids to uni. Wow. Hey, wow. so here was a system that was allegedly racist and against them, and then they thrived in thriving. that system, yeah, and then they helped people and other people um, and their own um, uh, neighborhoods, but their own families through that wow. system. And I think that's, we, we need to, I think in our country, we quick to forget our history. And I think sometimes we try and sanitize our history. You know, I don't think, mm. you know, all of history wasn't just in the in in, um, in the dawn raids. All of history for Pacifica people wasn't just in the in the Polynesian Panthers. There was a whole bunch of other stuff that was happening in our communities that brought real resilience and mana and strength and wow. helped our people thrive. That wasn't. That's not going to get a TV documentary. You know what oh, I mean? Yeah. And so I think we need to. We need to. I, I absolutely honor those generations. Oh, wow. You know, I think we, I think of the Koinga at Newton PIC, Leua, ah, you know, that dude brought over hundreds and thousands of people, helped them. You're never going to see a TV doco about that Koinga, wow. but he helped our families thrive. Ah, so I think that's what I mean. They, they just got on with it. They just mm. kept moving. They didn't blame the system. They just pushed and challenged. And I think uh, we've lost some of that ake. We've lost wow. some of wow. that resilience and, um, as, as a people. <laughs> Wow, wow. Mm. man, that's crazy, um, Ronji. Because when you say that, you think for this generation, we have no excuse. Eh? We have no, hey, brothers, we have no excuse to not be successful. But that—that's really tough to say. Mm. 
<clears throat> in this day and age, eh? We're so used to like um hey, let's come let's let's um let's talk about it. Let's um wrestle with some what what we're feeling because um a lot of the stuff that's happened, we've got to sort of try to acknowledge, but and then we've come you know, we've always blamed um the narrative around you gotta harden up and move on. Mm. And and but it's the, there seems to be like out of this conversation there's like a mm. oh shucks there's this tension or there's this balance around how do we grab that courage and run with it and mm. something oh man sorry because my, my as you're talking my mind's like going whoa <laughs> I'm wrestling with these faults and missions and and I think because we're used to a certain narrative in the, in the last few years and something I want um, if you can unpack a bit because when you say um don't blame the system, but there's this real um, mana around, like, you know the history. It sounds like you know the history and what's happened and then this other mis- history. How can we encourage our people and those who are listening to really um, to not blame the system and really, like, um, take take charge of what's, what's um, in front of you? Yeah, I think that's a good question. So I think part of it is what I said before too, like remember our history. We just talked about this mm. first, second, third wave of immigration of people that had amazing courage, amazing skills and with very little English and very little social capital that allowed them to move in society and yet they got through. Mm. And so I think there's, there's a lot of lessons and because that generation is passing away, we need to try and see yeah. how do we capture those stories. When my mum got sick um, with dementia in Australia, um, I flew over and I filmed um, hours and hours of just talking with her and hearing the story and understanding how did they do, do this? How did they buy a house? How did they get this done? How did they get that done? And I think, and and we recorded that to pass on to our to the kids, the grandkids, the great grandkids, because they can see the the matriarch and how she did it. So I think there's lessons on how we learn from the past, but I think there's also lessons too about actually how do we use the opportunities that we have. Mm. Our parents and our great grandparents, because yeah, you know, two thirds of the, the of the Pacific population in New Zealand is New Zealand born now. Mm. Okay, so it's it's changed. Hey, sixty seven percent of the Pacific population in New Zealand is now church going. Mm. About three, about uh, the last census. Oh, sorry, in the two thousand and six census, that was over eighty percent. So those dynamics that we had back then are changing quickly. Hey, it's a less church population. It's a it's it's a New Zealand born population. So it's a totally different context. So I think you're right. Also, it is hard to just say, well, look at what they did. Go hard. You know what I mean? Because it's a, it's a totally different context. Everything is should be done in its context. I guess my argument is learn from the history, understand what the opportunities that you have today that our your parents or grandparents mm. didn't have, and leverage off that. Use mm. that as social mm. capital. Wow. Use that as ways to progress your family. And again, define the terms. What is the change we want? Is it economic prosperity? Is it mental health? Is it everyone gets a university degree? I don't know. It, it, it's, it's different for different families. What I'm saying is you can leverage off those things, those opportunities that we have to actually move forward. I think sometimes we're so caught up in staying where we are and, and not understanding why the numbers are the way they are, why our communities are facing the challenges that they are without actually working through, or actually, how do we do this? And I think men, can I be really honest, our That's Pacific cool. men Please. play an absolutely critical role to that. I think masculine, me, uh, maleness, or I don't know the right word, but the idea of, of what a man is, is is being attacked in our culture today. There's this idea of tox, toxic masculinity. We've feminized men. We've tried to add all these different things to what, for me, the idea of what a man is comes back to scripture. I go back and I look to what scripture tells me a man should do in terms of a husband, in terms of if you're, if you're a parent or grandparent, in terms of being a father or grandfather. I think we learn from that. And so I think there's a challenge to us as Pacifica men in terms of what leaders looks like and, and look I'm not the leadership guru I don't like going to leadership conferences or leadership books but I can see gaps in our community when it comes to our men standing up for their families and, and, and not just l- l- hear me for a second here not just um, earning money that's a key role eh? that provider I think that's really critical but what's their role in terms of the 
spiritual health of their family in terms of the mental health or the emotional health or the all of those kind and I know it's hard men are working two three jobs getting by but I guess what I'm saying is I think there's a leadership void there when it comes to our Pacifica men and I think they need to be equipped encouraged and enabled to stand up and continue to be leaders in the way that our fathers and our grandfathers were with very little opportunity but they got by and they pushed through so I think there's a it is a challenging set of questions, but I, I do, you look, I am hopeful. I wouldn't be a Christian if I wasn't hopeful. And I think we need to be hopeful of the fact that actually there is change possible. We need to define what that change looks like. But I think there's a critical role in how men function in that change. And part of that is a leadership um, and, and, and understanding of what true masculinity or maleness or manhood looks like. And for me, based on my Christian worldview, this book tells me what that looks like. And for others, it might be different, but find out what that means for you. Oh, man, that's so sure, cool. Awesome. One, man, that's awesome. <laughs> Are you, oh, sorry. No, no, you go. No, I just, well, we're on the topic and you'll talk about that. <coughs> um, the word defines what manhood um, means to you. Are you able to give us a, what, what are some stuff that, the word tells us what manhood is. I think there's a there's a lot there in terms of the role of a husband. Hey, and I think you know we're meant to love our wives as Christ loves the church, and we and Paul writes about that in Ephesians and Corinthians, and so I think that's really critical. But I think one of the verses I was thinking about here uh, about when before I came today was in Second Timothy, and Second Timothy is Paul's last letter before he's he's killed for the faith. But I love what Paul says in Second Timothy, Timothy chapter two verse fifteen, where he says, "Study to show yourself a workman approved, rightly dividing the word of truth." That's that that is that is a challenge or a command to men and women, but I guess what I'm saying there is I think that's the leadership gap. That's the void that I see where I think our men need to take that verse to heart, to study, to show themselves a workman approved in the Word of God, and really feed and um, and nurture the spiritual and emotional and mental and holistic development of their families. And so I think I I was thinking and praying about that verse in terms of, okay, that teaches me as a man that I meant to study this book to understand how to live out my life as a husband, as an uncle, as a worker. And so I think those are probably the ones that I would would, would touch on really quickly. And I think think the the Bible um, has amazing guidance and and answers to multiple different questions about that. But I think the ultimate picture of manhood for me is Christ himself. Hey, who had sacrificial love, who was meek, but he wasn't weak. Hey, you know, he wasn't a pufta. You know what I mean? Like yeah. he stood up, he 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 wrestled, he challenged, who was who was obedient and who was a leader. Who, you know, all those traits of who the Messiah is and was and is, that's who I should emulate. Hey, you know, Paul says in Colossians, be therefore be imitators of Christ. I meant to be like this man. And so I think for me, that's where I've really tried to ground who I am as a man and who other and who and what I think manhood should be like. Hopefully, wow. the answers mm. was that's cool, man. That's so cool. And it's really awesome to see um, some of your worldview impacted or like grounded in scripture. And so I, I wonder, has that sort of faith been a part of your family for a while, or is it something you sort of came into on your own throughout your lived experience and youth? Or um, yeah. how did how did that sort of story with faith come about. I think also we, um, you know, we we were the traditional religious, you know, church boys. You know, church on Sunday lived like the devil for the rest of the week. You know what I mean? <laughs> so we grew up in Mangele PIC. So shout out to all the PIC world out there. Um, and so, but I think for us, you know, again, I said before we had those risk factors. We were all trying to be tough and all trying to be bad and all that kind of stuff. But um, it, long story short, for me, it was role modelled by a woman. And it was my sister that was became the first born again believer in our family at university, and mm. so she became a witness. And me and my boys were actually planning to do some really dumb stuff um, to pay the mortgage at home, and we were gonna do some dumb stuff. I won't go into I won't elaborate <laughs> into what the dumb stuff was. And then, long story short, I went to a church service, and I had I was religious growing up, but I heard the gospel preached, and I finally understood. Christ died for my sins. He paid the price for my sins. Um, He paid the price I wouldn't have to face uh, eternity in hell. 
And that's why Christ died. He was the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And I understood that gospel at the age of 18. To be honest, all those years before, bro, I was, you know, we often say in our street preaching, sitting inside McDonald's doesn't make you a hamburger. Mm. Ah, think about it. And sitting inside a church doesn't automatically make you a Christian. It doesn't get you to heaven. I was that hamburger. I thought I was going to be good, be, uh, go to heaven because um, I went to church. Actually, it all changed that night when I understood the gospel and I acknowledged Christ as Savior. And I think, and I've tr I've always been, tried to ensure, and I've, you know, I've made a lot of dumb mistakes in my walk with the Lord, but I've always tried to make sure that my Christian worldview or biblical worldview influences everything. See, I, the way I see life is I view everything that I do, business decisions, life decisions, mission decisions, I view that through the lens of this book. Mm. Hey, I don't want to view um, this book through the lens of the world. And I think that's the real challenge where, and look, I know people are going to disagree with this worldview. Even Basfika people are hard mm. out disagreeing mm. with that worldview. But this worldview gives me hope. It gives me uh, a purpose. It gives me courage. It gives me stability. It gives me uh, guidance in terms of how to live my life. And I, so I've, I've always tried to live that way. But there's that difference between religion and faith. Eh? Religion mm -hmm. is about how we please God. A eh? true biblical faith is about how, about how God reached us or saved us through his son. And so that's the journey that I've been over the last wow. several years since 18. And I'm not a perfect man, bro. <laughs> Jay, I've, I mean, not, not as close as Betia to the holiness of God, but... Yeah, I've made a lot of mistakes in my walk, but I do want to make sure that my Christian worldview influences and shapes every decision and every um, and every path that I take. Not easy in this mm. world, but I try. Yeah, I was going to say, it's definitely, that can't be an easy thing um, in the world that we live in today. And perhaps in some of the fields that you've had to sort of navigate yourself, um, have there been times where you've sort of been forced to, you know, people trying to get you to sort of move from your point of view and... Um, Absolutely. I mean, it happens all the time. I mean, and uh, the current place that I work at, you know, there's been several times where, you know, I work for a Christian organization. There's been several times when they told me to actually stop talking about Jesus and don't, and I said, well, fire me then. Hey, fire me. I'm willing to lose my job. I don't care about the, I'd rather stand for truth and righteousness than uh, be comfortable and bow down to that system. Mm. And so I think um, there's been huge times where, where I've been challenged to compromise. And again, I've probably failed many times, but there's been a lot of times, especially in recent years, because I work in politics. I, mm. I, I work in parliament. I work in the legal field. And there's a lot of people that hate my worldview, increasingly hate my worldview. And that's all good because, uh, you know, Jude 1 verse 3 says, contend earnestly for the faith. Eh? And so that's my job to contend for the faith in those places. But my desire is to not compromise. Mm. Eh? I don't want to compromise my faith and compromise my values just because of a paycheck. Or, and I know that might sound really <laughs> fatalistic and easy for me, but I think um, it's all or nothing for me. I think, mm. you know, I, I live urgently. I live in, in extremes. And so um, uh, there's been a lot of, I mean, I was involved in a cannabis debate um, mm. several years ago uh, where I almost lost my job several times. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, you know, and and um, and um, Betia's auntie Helen Clark uh, came after me a few times, and I think, but I was that wasn't a gospel stand or a Christian worldview stand. I thought they were standing up for truth, mm. and, and was standing up for, st for 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 evidence and statistics, mm. and the evidence all weighed against legalizing cannabis. So I think it's a, it's a case by case. But how do we case by case apply this Christian mm. worldview if you are a Christian? And I hope you are, because life is like a vapor. Anyway, um, <laughs> but um, uh, uh, the, how do we apply that worldview to that situation that we're in? And so because of the area I work in, I get challenged all the time. But I see my, my work as a ministry, as an opportunity to represent Christ in places that don't like him. Mm. Um, and I've, you know, people have sworn at me and... and uh, cancelled me. They've tried, I've, I've probably been cancelled every time, several times already. But I don't care. Like I think um, I'd rather honour my God than honour man. Mm. Oh man, that's cool. Ho hopefully awesome. that answers, yeah, bro. Yeah. yeah. Just for our viewers and just for someone that's tuning in for the first time and wondering, oh, what's this guy? Who's this guy? Um, are you able to sort of unpack a bit about the work that you do? Sure. So um, I um, my degrees are in law and politics. 
Uh, so um, currently work um, as a lawyer and the principal policy advisor for the Salvation Army. So it was a Christian organization. Mm -hmm. eh? So I'm blessed because um, generally my view, my values align with their values. Uh, and so the, the easiest way I describe my job is my job is to create as much trouble as possible in government. Eh? So <laughs> my job is to advocate this disrupt challenge how law and policy is made and if you think about it you some a lot of us don't really think about law and policy so who cares about that stuff actually every aspect of your life mm. is governed by law or policy eh? and so uh my job is to try and shift and challenge how we do housing policy um uh, food banks addictions work uh child poverty education all of those things but the, the blessing of my work is we do it from a christian perspective so again I, i'm really in a blessed position i'm privileged and so we argue for changes in law and changes in policy based on a christian worldview and also based on the um the hundred and forty thousand clients that are people that use our services throughout the year so that's my work at the moment i haven't been fired yet <laughs> um, but maybe after the mandate podcast <laughs> might get cancelled again so yeah uh, and I, um, it's a it's a hard job. Um, it's a but it's a blessed job, you know. Like, um, and and I also uh, you get a, I'm an, uh, you get a chance to advocate for communities, you know, and you know down in Wellington and all the pa so called powerful people are, and you're challenging the narratives. Hey, and you're you're challenging history. I mean, you're challenging where people are standing and challenging ideologies and worldviews, and you're wrestling with these things and. So I, I know that I'm in a very privileged position in terms of work. Yeah, wow. that's awesome. What are one of the things that, um, in the past or something you're working on at the moment that you've challenged and that's benefited our, our communities? Yeah, good question. Also, so um, we've all seen those mobile trucks that go around, you know, sort of selling, you know, mm. a, a t-shirt for about thirty bucks that you can get <laughs> at um, at the warehouse for yeah. five bucks. So yeah. those are called mobile traders. Um, and so um, I think they all originated from Otar. But anyway, that's a different story. So um, <laughs> don't hate me. Don't hate me. So anyway, um, so mobile traders, uh, they're like leeches. Hey, they just leech on people and, and especially on poorer, vulnerable people. They would mm. go after um, people with disabilities. Uh, they would go after the elderly, those that are isolated. So long story short, I did a business case about three years ago uh, for the Salvation Army. Let's start our own mobile trucks. But instead of offering uh, rip-off prices, let's offer uh, no interest uh, or low interest loans to people so they don't go out to loan sharks. Mm. And, they, they, and they can find an easier way to find affordable food or even through our food bank. So uh, we developed a, a business called The Good Shop. Uh, and we, and it was it's what's called a disruption um, innovation project. So it was just there to try and disrupt the market, disrupt that sector. And so we closed the business. The Sally's closed the business down uh, late last year. When we started, there was about forty of those businesses operating, mostly in South Auckland, mostly in Porirua and Gisborne, and in areas with high Maori and Pacifica populations. So we, when we started the business, there was uh, it was a not-for-profit business, but um, when we started it, there was about 40 businesses operating in those poor areas. By the time we finished, there was about six left. Wow. And so we wanted to disrupt the market. We had changes in how the law and policy was made under um, under the under the the law and the regulations. And this look, that's not all me. Look, this is a whole group of people. But when I wrote the business case, I thought I'll just give it a shot, see what happens, see if the army would give me some money to do this. And by the grace of God, and and look, my mum used those trucks when we first moved from Samoa. Because it, 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 you know, it's hard to find, you know, you don't have transport, you don't have the language, you know, so a lot of our people use those trucks, but people were being abused and preyed upon by those trucks. And so now the fact that they're almost out of business, I give glory to wow. God for, because then that's a challenge of, again, that's seeing the system. Understanding that there's broken parts of that system, how do we get the change that we want in that system that's going to benefit not just brown people, but people. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the change that I wanted. And yeah, by the grace of God, we are, we're down to about five or six business wow. of those businesses left and we're going to keep going after. So that's one of the things where you, wow. it's not just about uh, academically thinking about ideas and, and, and challenging people in Wellington, but what are the, what are the tech, uh, tangible things that we can do to create change? So I praise God for that, man. man it's been a cool. That's, yeah. that's awesome. Cheers to that, guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> praise the cool, my Lord. Praise Lord. Oh, good job, good job. Awesome. Good job. So yeah, we closed the business down um, uh, and we've got a, I did a, um, 
I put forward a business case to start a social enterprise supermarket. I was about to ask yep, you yeah, bro. Tell and us more about it. Have you got that. some money for that, like, Jay? Just, <laughs> is Mandate willing to sponsor that? Oh, we could feel like. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, we're, look, I wrote a paper to try and disrupt that that market and um and see if we can get some support there's been some really interesting conversations about that and there's a whole bunch of wealthy people that uh and in, 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 interested but i guess for me it was what was the change i wanted i wanted to get rid of food banks wow. that's what i wanted because i think we create dependency through that model it's they do help i'm not saying they don't help but my thought was how do we break that cycle of dependency which Unfortunately, Māori and Pacifica are overrepresented in those numbers as usual, and that's a reality we have to face. But how do we try and break some of that cycle of dependency through other models of food sustainability, food welfare, and a, and, a, and so an idea of a social enterprise supermarket? So I don't know, Jay. Have you got any money? No. Okay. <laughs> Let's just pray about it. But, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So, so how student does the supermarket work? So the idea was also that right now there's a duopoly in New Zealand. So there's only two supermarket chains mm. um, that really dominate, and the government wants to break that duopoly because it's unfair, and people suffer, the ones that suffer are us because we're, we're paying. You know the food prices right mm. now: food, petrol, housing costs, all like this. Say hey, they just shot up. So how it, how this would work is that this would be a social enterprise, so not for profit. So where we would um, provide different social uh, social enterprise supermarkets across the country using our church networks with the Salvation Army, using iwi groups and Māori, Māori hapu and, and, and areas of high deprivation and actually provide places where they can f- um, find affordable goods, sh- uh, groceries, as well as cooking places, community gardens. It's just trying to wow. build a network around this. You've got the pieces. What I When I wrote this paper, you've got the pieces already out there. Hey, the pieces that will help the system improve. Again, we're talking about systems, eh? Mm. But no one's actually brought that that whole thing together oh. to try and create a disruption, not just to um, the duopoly or these two businesses that dominate everything, but a disruption to the fact that we're giving out the army. The Salvation Army gave out one hundred and fourteen thousand food parcels in two thousand and twenty. Mm. Hey, that's almost double what we usually give. Last year, we gave out 77,000 food parcels across the country. Again, Māori and Pacific families overrepresented in that. So when I look at those numbers, I just can't sit there and think, oh, let's just, you know, let's just continue doing this. Mm. These are families that are in generational dependency. I've seen grandmothers, mothers, and now children of the same family come through our food banks. Wow. That's dependency. That's living off the government. <laughs> That's living off the system instead of actually moving, coming back to what we said before, moving, thriving. Um, growing as a family and so how do we break that and part of that was this idea to create little hubs social enterprise supermarkets where it would be just like a a normal supermarket but have cooking classes and food banks and um, community gardens and other things connected to it that would build and grow community as well as um, as well as bringing an income to pay for the 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 overheads and stuff so I don't know if it's going to go anywhere all sorts but look My, talk, to, talk to the people. They got yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, community. Look, please, man, yeah. So send it to Mandate. <laughs> mandate. <laughs> <laughs> mandate might be the key sponsor. <laughs> but you know, when I started my businesses in 07 with um, my brother and and, and um and Betty is a good friend, um, counselor, one of the counselors. When I started those businesses, I think it was all about better to die trying than to die wandering. Mm. And then I thought, man, I'm just going to give it a go. If it fails, it fails. But at least I'm trying to make a difference mm. by the grace of God based on this book rather than mm. just being a spectator in life. And I'm too, I don't want to be a spectator. I want to actually see how do we use all the rich stuff that this book gives us and actually apply that to real life. Oh, wow. So, yeah, see what happens, man. Watch the space. Watch the space. Yeah, I love it all. That's so cool, Roger. You, you, you brought up a good point, Roger. You know, you think of the food banks. And I think a lot of people out there who are probably challenging what you just said, Ron, you're like, food banks, man, food banks are good, man, we're helping the community, we're helping our people. Um, and so you, you, how you put it in terms of generational, you got your granddads, your your grandmas, and your, your parents, and now the kids are going forth. What's um, what's the one of the things in terms of, okay, in terms of our mindset, is more so as men, do you think, is, is it because that we just, you know, we just can't, we're in a rut as, as to why we're kind of going around the cycle in terms of, Dependency and, and so forth, or was it just was it just yeah. the system again? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm not a psychologist or the the greatest 
of insights. I don't know how to, in terms of what's happening in, in our minds, but I, I do think there's a poverty mentality. Hey, and I think that we're so caught up in the poverty mentality, which comes back to some of the things that we talked about before, victimhood. I'm a victim because I'm brown. Or coming back to a poverty mentality where, oh, well, the system's racist, so I can't get anywhere. And I think we've all almost given up before we've tried. And so I think when it comes back to some of the dependency, and look, look, I'm not trying to be a, an egg here. Food banks do play a, a role, and, 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 and families in desperate need, we've helped them. And, and I know there's many others that do that. I guess what I'm saying is, is that really where we want families to be living in? Mm. A week to week living off a food parcel without really breaking those, some of those cycles of dependency or addiction or housing issues or violence that is in there. And so I think part of that is this, uh, there's a poverty mentality that I think is that we're believing in some of those lies that we're telling ourselves and that the system is telling us and the narratives are telling us and actually seeing, well, what are the things that can actually break through that and, and bring about real, um, real impact for meaningful change? And I think, I think it does begin a lot with the hearts and minds of people. Um, but, and, and so, look, if we, we're going to continue food banks at the Salvation Army and keep doing that if that's your work. Mm. But what I'm saying is, look, there's got to be a better way to this. If, are we going to just keep our Absolutely. families? And they, these are brown families, predominantly brown yeah. families. I'm, it breaks my heart when I'm seeing Samoans and Tongans and Iwayans and Maoli coming through and getting these food parcels week after week. You know what? What is the employment prospects? What's happening in the home? The violence, the, the 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 challenges that they're facing. I think we've just given up in here and in here without actually finding things that are going to give us hope and meaning and purpose and 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 and, 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 a, and a desire to change. And so, um, and if you, if if you lose the battle inside, and again, I'm not a psychologist, but if you lose the battle inside then it's going to be really difficult to actually live out that change that you know, and actually make change in, in real life. Yeah. Ah. Mm. And again, when like, uh, uh, coming back to the men, I think, again, it's the same thing. It's that void of leadership that I often see with men. It's that leading, um, that, that God-given role that, that, that has been placed on men go to other parts of society and we're letting the school parent or the, the church parent rather than the, the, the men or the parents themselves. So I think there's a multiple things, but... For me, it's the hearts and minds of people that need to shift before we can shift all the other external stuff. Wow. Man, that's awesome. And you touched on a really important word, I think, sometimes that um, um, people don't take as seriously, and it's that the idea of hope. Mm. Like, I just think, man, if a soul has no hope, then, you know, it's a dark, dark world out there. And so um, I really like the examples that you've given. You've kind of helped highlight at the beginning, I was sort of thinking, how would one think of... Um, idealizing the change they want to see. Um, it's sometimes so overwhelming to think about the system that we live in and, you know, mm. all the many facets of it. Um, but just the way you talked about, you know, just because something works now doesn't mean there's not a better way out there. And it's okay to question, is there a better way? And sometimes that's the spark that you need to think a little bit bigger. And, um, you know, I, I really feel for a lot of the people that live in that sort of, victim mentality or they sort of tied to poverty because that's what they've grown up with they feel like the only way to not take the blame on themselves is to put the blame on something whether sure. it's poverty whether it's you know whatever it is um and so i just feel like you know the hope that you talk about and i can kind of see the links now tying to your faith and how that plays a part and giving you hope that there's always a better way that you know you've always got ground to stand on to push further mm. Yeah, so I just thought I just wanted to comment and say it was ideas are connecting in my mind personally, and I thought it was really cool the examples you gave, tying it back to your faith, and giving us a real look at some of the things that you might want to think about when you're trying to think about the change you want to make in the world. Yeah, and I think yeah. And look, without hope, I think we would have a really boring life to mm. be honest. Like, it's, it's like a, a body without, like you said, with body without a soul, there's no real hope for that. And I think. I think when it comes back to, let, let me be really honest. For me, the ultimate change. I've I've been in this game. I'm 43. I'm an old man now. You're not <laughs> not young moops like you guys. But you know, I've been I've been around the block for a bit. I've never seen anything change a life or transform a family or a man even other than Jesus Christ. No program, no initiative, no self-help, no counseling. All that stuff might have a place, but I've never seen anything transform, truly transform and circuit break 
real problems in a person's life or a family's life other than meeting Christ. And, and even though I'm involved in all this other social change, hey, social, superma- social enterprise supermarkets or good shop or any other things that I do for work, actually my primary goal in life is to see people come to, to salvation in Christ. Because for me, that's the, the that's the ultimate goal. All this other stuff is me trying to be the hands and feet of Christ. Mm. But actually, my 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 real joy in the week is when I'm street preaching on the corner in Mangili. Mm. Hey, my real joy in the week is when we're doing Bible studies and working with young men and unpacking what the scriptures say about how to be a man, how to be a worker, how to be a student, how to be a husband, all those things. And and, and it doesn't mean I don't like the work that I do in terms of social change, but for me, what use is all of that social change that I'm involved in without actually the hearts and minds of true change within a man and nothing changes a life like Christ because if I've, if it's not about Christ for me then I'm just a glorified social worker mm. I'm just a glorified person that's trying to help improve this their life here where actually is, in terms of my hope there's a life beyond this life you know what I mean so mm. I, I, I have to apply that and um, if, if, any, if I could, I, could spe- I would love to spend all my time street preaching, giving out Bibles, giving out gospel tracts, because again, nothing transforms like Christ. But if God calls me to some of this work, just as he's called you guys to your work and the men and the people that are listening to their work, then I have to outwork my worldview in that. Mm. But for me, the ultimate change is Christ and Christ alone. Wow. Man, that's wow. awesome. That's so cool. Um, how, what would you say to those, those men who are watching... Um, who are watching the, 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 this episode, Ronji? Because you're right, there are going to be some guys who are watching this, man, this, this, man this, you guys talk about religion too much, and now you talk about Bible too much, and your worldview is different from mine. We're all kind of um, out there and they're thinking, hey, what's this all about? Because they, they probably want to, want to know personally, how did the Bible, how did um, the Messiah, Hamashiach, or Yahusha, how did he actually change you from, like you talk about transformation? So they might be wondering, I want to know, what's the, what's the big deal? What is it? You can Because you know, we can all talk, share Bible verses and, and so forth. But are they probably they probably wanted to know for you personally, um, Roger, your, your journey, like how like from the inside out, how did how did it, or from outside in, how did the, this whole thing in terms of of God really change your life? Because mm. I know you know, there's been a lot of things like your PIC, you had the, the, the Jewish framework and all that, aerial. But yeah, I think for, if you could just tell them like this is what it's done for me personally. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, I've touched on that in a couple of different places. Eh? The movement from religion and being a church boy to actually being in a relationship with the Lord. That was the real key. But I think the, the shift was, look, and I'm not trying to say that I'm, um, I've am i killed 30 men or <laughs> I'm the head of the common sheroes <laughs> or anything like that. Look, but um, I should, I, if, if I hadn't chosen Christ, I'd be dead or in prison. With with all honesty, with the way that my life was going, the way that my decisions were going, um, my my friends, the boys and I, I, this is that dumb decision that I didn't talk about before, but I was paying the mortgage at home from uh, the age of 18 onwards. So I was working about four jobs, uh, bouncing at clubs and um, and working in the warehouse because my parents had moved to Oz. So I needed to pay the mortgage eh? and I, I didn't want my parents to come home. And I'm the youngest. So I was, I was doing this. And so I failed my first year of university. And then my boys and I decided, let's go rob a bank. Let's think about robbing a bank. This is going to help me um, pay my mortgage. It's going to set me up. But my other boys said, let's go sell some stuff. They had all the stuff ready. And so, look, I'm not trying to sensationalize that stuff, but those were the decisions that were sitting before me as a young man, 18 years old. And then as I as I faced this, this, this stuff and I knew that where my pathway was heading, a, a month later I went to my sister's church and I heard the gospel. And I responded to that, that invitation of God's free gift of grace. And for those that look at me and think, oh, what a church boy thing, or that's your worldview, it doesn't work for me. Man, that's all good. You, you do you. You're responsible for yourself. What I'm saying is that everyone lives for eternity. The question is where you will spend that eternity. And so if, if that's not in your worldview, then that's all good. I pray for you. And, 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 but this worldview has given me hope and purpose and, and a desire to bring change and all these different factors. But that's my, that's my testimony, essentially, eh? that um, I, I, and I often say this when I'm out street preaching, I, sh- I, w- I should be dead or in prison because of the way that I was living my life and the way that I was about to live my life. But by the grace of God, he caught me. 
And so I think, look, that's the, that's the change. If it's not good enough for anyone or who's watching, man, that's all good. No, but that's the change, and that's the change that I saw in my life. And you don't need to be a, 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 a bikey, or you don't need to have a, a murder history. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like It doesn't matter whatever that is, whatever, you, you, whatever past you've come from. But for me, that was the transformation that came. And it was a... And it's a, a the Christian journey is a marathon. It's not a sprint, mm. and it's been a tough journey, a hard journey. It, it became harder mm. when I when 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 I received that free gift of grace. But that's the journey that I'm on. So hopefully that answers oh, man, your awesome. question also. Awesome. Awesome. But that's the change, wow. um, and well, tell, I will never go back as, as well, Roger. Because I know you've been to different countries as a missionary and so forth. But tell us, I know you went to, to China as well. So tell us about that. You had to, the Jim, Bibles, the Bibles. And is this, uh, are we being recorded? <laughs> is it like a plant or something? <laughs> look, hey, um, look um, the, yeah, I've been, we've been blessed to, uh, to serve as missionaries overseas and, um, and have a real burden for Christians who are suffering and persecuted and tortured and raped and, um, and, and, and being abused for the faith. And so, yeah, the, being involved in some sex trafficking rescue work with some of our friends in India. Um, again, hey, Christians oh, living out wow, the worldview wow. in the real world. Hey, you know, we've um, our friends have planted churches and orphanages in, in Tanzania and Brazil and, and a bunch of other places. So, look, I think it's a... It's a blessing, and we desire to go back um, overseas in those places. China is is next level, man. That's a that's a crazy country. Um, I uh, uh, communism is evil. Commun, commun, with it, and socialism is just a nice way of saying communism. Come on, man. You know this is this is it's wicked. It's evil. All the socialist, cultural, Marxist stuff. There's, I feel like swearing, but there's rubbish that's coming into our country and coming into the West. It is evil stuff. And look at the stuff that's happening in in Russia and communist nations. And we've been blessed to uh, to take uh, different materials, um, Bible materials and and stuff into um, restricted nations. Uh, and so and and uh, and it, and that's a real joy because uh, that's the that's what our worldview is based on. Is this book? And so yeah. It's, Hard living in those countries, hard serving in those countries, but we desire to go back. So, um, yeah, it's been it's been, it's been pretty out of it. We're hoping to go back to a couple of places, but um, I think it gives you perspective on what it means to come back to this country. Yeah, and we're blessed, man. We we should not have the levels of poverty and dependency and the number of food parcels that we're giving out. We're such a, a beautiful, wealthy country. I've lived in extreme poverty in places like the Philippines or seen that stuff in the favelas in Brazil, and it, it is crazy. We are so blessed. I don't know why anyone wants to be a G here. You know what I mean? Like, mm. it, it is an amazing country, and yet we've got our own issues. And so I I'm, not, I'm not trying to be self-righteous about coming back into New Zealand. I just think, you know, we don't know how good we've got it. Mm. So close. <laughs> oh man, this um. <sighs> well, let's, let's get back to politics. I know we've got to touch on the bomb. Please tell us because I want. I'm really interested to hear what with Haddon Clark and the debate with Haddon Clark with the weed and, and marijuana. Because I because I've I've I watched that clip. I watched a few of that clips. Are oh, those clips? But I I'm just assuming that they kind of edited some some parts. Um, Ronji. So if you can kind of elaborate on that and touch on, on that stuff, how, how was that for you and, and those who were on the panel on, the, on that day? It was The whole thing was really hard also because I can't stand being in front of people. I don't like public stuff. I'm an introvert by nature. My family, my loved ones know this. And so I don't like media. I don't like um, speaking at places, but that's what the Lord allows at this stage. So it was really tough um, even just fronting up to some of those debates. And then you're seeing, you know, Helen Clark and, you know, that was, you know, that was worship next to uh, Princess Di for Samoans. <laughs> so you saw the like, islanders were lifting her up. And so it was, it was tough. Um, we knew, it was unfair. It was a completely unfair debate because we knew that w that it was slanted toward the towards the yes vote, but I just thought I looked at the numbers, I looked at the stories, I talked to my boys that are selling that stuff, um, I, I I I talked to the people that are in that world, and I just knew how bad it would be for our communities if we legalized that stuff, and I still stand by that, but it was just really tough when. When we did some a lot of the interviews, especially on the TV3 one, they edited a lot of the stuff that I, they cut it out, especially this line that I said, um, I said that uh, that their attempt to legalize marijuana is an attempt to 
is is um it's what's called libertine so it's sort of like a way just for you to enjoy yourself so it's i said to him this is your libertine a way to lib- libertine way to legalize marijuana so that you can smoke your joint at, in in gray lynn but mask it in a way that's going to benefit people in mangili mm. you know what i mean and so I, and and I, and I didn't i wasn't trying to play the race card too much but what i was saying is Actually, it's gonna it's gonna be cool for you guys. Those shops, those four hundred weed shops, are gonna be places like mm. Mangili, Otara, Puriru, and so on. It's gonna damage our people. So it wasn't easy, bro. I'm glad it's finished. Um, look, I work in politics. I hate politics. I can't stand that stuff. I think I think there's um, too many snakes in the game. And um, and let me be really honest. Can I say this to our Pacifica yeah, people, yeah, to yeah, our Pacifica please. men? The government's not our savior. Hey, we, we, we're coming to the government and, and looking for the funding and the answers and the handouts and all that kind of stuff. And I think we've put too much reliance on government. I don't believe, and, and government has overreached and overstepped and extended what the powers that they really should have. I don't think the government is the be or end or savior for Pacifica people to deal with the issues that we have. I think there's amazing answers and resilience and innovation in our own communities. And when we partner with other groups, hey, cut across some of those boundaries because they try and keep us tribal, but cut across that to try and see shift, whether it's the good shop or social enterprise supermarkets or cutting off some of the marijuana talk in our communities. And I think we can get real shift, a social shift. Um, but I just look. I get tired of working in this space because we've we've elevated the government like they're the be or end all of our of of the solutions for our problems. They play a role. I don't get that wrong. They get a, they play a role, and politi- politicians play a role. Even though I wish it was less of a role, but I think um, we need to understand that there's answers within our communities ourselves. Wow, man! Let's man. just give a hand for it. Like, oh, honestly, man. you know. Um, Oh, yes, oh, oh, yes, 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 we needed a strong voice and you were one of them during that time and and just praise god that you know we ended up um not going down that that road and i know probably somewhere down the track will come back it will be, and, and i'll be honest too uh, charles if you think about where politics have brought us now yeah. hey we've got the most liberal abortion laws mm. in the world We've got um, conversion therapy that essentially outlines outlaws the ability to share um, this the, this book's view of gender and sexuality. We've got hate speech laws coming. We've got all this kind of stuff. This is that, and I can't stand politics, but we need to be under, understanding what's actually happening in this space. For me, and look, I don't I don't vote left or right. I don't actually care about that stuff. But this is not the labor of my of my parents. This is not the same people that were standing up for my parents as workers. And I think, and this is going real political now, but I just think there's an ideological shift that's happening that I don't know if our Pacifica people, our Pacifica men are really on top of what's happening here. The shifts that are happening in our schools and our workplaces that move away from those values that we have as people into something that uh, a different ideology that doesn't, doesn't connect and doesn't fit. And so, look, I'll take shot at any politician that I can, but I just think we need to wake up some, hey, everyone talks about woke, man. Yeah, we need yeah. to we, we need to wake up about some of this stuff that's happening in our backyard that affects us and affects our families and it and damages our families. And you're right, the the cannabis stuff, the euthanasia that we don't we we don't value life at the beginning of life, the conception, and now at the end of life. Life is mm. cheap in our country. That's essentially the message that we're sending our young people and our and our children. And so if we can't get a handle on what's happening in those spaces and have people that represent our values and our system and our and our beliefs truly, then we're just gonna get caught in that tsunami, man. We're just gonna be drowning into this ideological shift that I think is gonna hurt our people even more. Wow. Shot also. Man. We just wanna encourage you to keep on going also. I know it's tiring. But um we might need to just comment um, 
down below when this video comes out if you want to see more of Ranji no. you might have to do a segment for our, mm. our people or our viewers where we uh, yeah, talk about certain issues to really enlighten our, our, our community and I think Betio is going to end up studying to be more um, are you going into politics alert? bro are you <laughs> sorry are you, is this the announcement look I endorse you bro I endorse you bro <laughs> oh man well, that, you know, since we're on the politics um, <laughs> kind of issue, uh, I'll be interested to get your, your thoughts on Ronji in terms of our people, our, our, our Pacifica people and our Māori people who are in politics, or our, our so-called leaders in politics. And so uh, we, we just kind of touched on the, on the work aspects of, of sometimes in politics. But how do you think in terms of, and it might be kind of, might be quite a personal one, but it's, it's not in any way attacking any politicians but what do you think in terms of our people who are in politics? Do you think that they're part of the solution or part of the problem? Hey, man, I give credit where credit's due. If they've worked their way up to those yeah. levels of parliament or council, then, man, so be it. That's, that's, a, that's a big effort. I think the challenge that I find when I work in those spaces is um, I wish I had I saw more courage from our Māori and Pacifica politicians, especially our Pacifica politicians, when it comes to some of the issues that we're facing. I think they they the the system or the machinery of government and, and political parties takes over, and it ends up you know you sort of vote with the machine rather than vote for what's really on your conscience, what's really um, uh, you know what's really legit and true. And so um, uh, look, they are all. Well paid, uh, <laughs> uh, talented, capable people. I just wish they had more courage when it came when it comes to actually addressing some of the real issues, and not not just the real issues, not the ideological rubbish, mm. the real issues that are facing people. Hey, the real housing stuff, the addiction stuff, all of that stuff that's damaging families. You know, the family violence stuff is again Maori and Pacifica overrepresented. We have it used to be one family harm incident every five minutes in our country. Now it's one in every three minutes. Hey, that's one every three minutes. There's a there's domestic violence happening in our in our country, and often our people are involved in that. So I don't wow. see the courage, the ideas, and the real ake, mm. using that word again, mm. the ake from our politicians in terms of actually shifting. Um, I think there's too much interest, self interest. I think there's too much voting on party lines, and actually rather than voting for your people. Mm. You're there to represent your people, your constituents. And right now, I don't see that happening much. I think it's more about voting for the machinery and voting for your leaders and voting for your self-preservation than it is for actually voting for change that will really bring about change for your people. Well, wow, man. Well said. Well said also. Okay, well, that's, that's in terms of politicians, our, our Pacific politicians and Māori. But I'm just wondering in terms of our church leaders also. I know maybe kind of Are you creating. trying to get me in trouble here? <laughs> <laughs> Are you trying to no, no, set me up and no. then it'll be like, shucks, this guy. No, because no, I, I think it's... Uh, I've already been cancelled anyway, so <laughs> the poly four. Don't worry, we're talking. <laughs> but yeah, in terms of, in terms of our church, and also our, our Pacific men and, and, and Maori men, what do you think? Do, do you think our, our Pacific church leaders are, are actually part of the, in terms of change? Are they actually doing what you think that, or we believe as, as believers should be doing? What, what, do you, what do you think? What are your thoughts? And I know it's a bit touchy, but I think you just throw it out there because I think it should, it should be um, discussed or, or, th or talked about. I think we got to discuss. You got to mm. wrestle with some of the hard topics and then get a hiding afterwards. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so again, send all your hate mail to Mandate, please. I, look, man. Um, <laughs> when I when I look at the at, at, at the church leaders, look, the primary purpose of a biblical pastor is to preach the gospel and equip the saints. Mm. Hey, I think church pastors are trying too busy trying to be social workers and, uh, and, and business owners and cafe owners rather than preach the gospel and equip the saints. Mm. That's really what a pastor should be. So I questioned, I would challenge and wonder about the true salvation of many of our church leaders, oh. whether it comes from a charismatic background or a straight up religious one. I think we need to understand, look, you look at what, what Peter talks about in First Peter around the shepherds. You look at what Paul says to Timothy about um, what it means to be a, a pastor and having the qualifications. So I, don't, I just wonder about that part, hey, the, the biblical theological aspect. In terms of the work side, look, I don't know, man. I, one of the things that I, I struggle with, and I know I live in that fight, love, love your life, as a Samoan, but we elevate the people, the, the, the ministers to a point where it breaks us. Mm. 
mm. you know, and, 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 I, and I would challenge that we have, and part of that comes to the money issue, eh, whether it's a lofa or tithing or whatever it is, and I have my own views on that, which I, um, I would challenge a lot of those views from, from this book. Mm. Um, but I think we've elevated our ministers to the point where we're, we're trying to get them to do too much. Mm. At the same time, um, you know, look, I think they can play a role in all the other issues and challenges that we're facing. But again, it's, I, I don't want my pastor to be a social worker. I don't want my pastor to be necessarily a business owner. I want them to help me understand this book and grow from there and learn how to apply this book in real life. So look, I know that, that the government loves to use churches, but that's quickly declining for us as Basfika people. Hey, I told the stat before that it used to be over 80% of us were church people and now it's down to 67%. You watch the next uh, census, it'll probably drop close to about maybe 55%. Mm -hmm. So actually that whole idea that churches are the answer to address Pacific issues, that's changing quickly mm -hmm. because we're not going to church anymore. Mm -hmm. And so we need to understand, ministers need to understand what is the shift that they need to do in response to that? So, look, I just think there's there's a lot of issues there about elevating uh, the the pastors too much, and I've seen it on the other end where families are coming in and asking for loans and food parcels because they've given to their church before they've given. Now, this is touchy as mm -hmm. touchy as, and I I know that yeah, and I'm happy to discuss this further cool. with, with anyone that wants to, but you know they're coming in to get this help because they've given to their church before they've paid for their, their own shopping and their own kids and their own lives. And I, and I don't think that's right. That's not what the Bible shows. And so I think there's a lot of issues in the church itself first, rather than try and be a, 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 an agent of social change. They need to work out how to work with their own families and their own leaderships first. Does that sort of answer? No, but this, that, that's so cool, man, because it is, it is quite touchy and it is quite, quite deep in terms of, yeah, obviously, people who might be some of the men who might be watching this, and some maybe even be pastors be watching this. And, hey, I, I totally oppose what, to what Ronji is saying. I don't like what you're saying. It's totally untrue. Or they might even to the point of saying hey, it's unbiblical what you're saying. But I think in terms of what you're saying, also is that you're right in terms of leadership, in terms of men. Uh, and I love the fact that you're saying that we're not looking for men or pastors to be your social workers and, and so forth. We need men, like you're saying, men who are going to lead, but who are going to speak this truth and from here from this word. And uh, I love the fact that you, you you're not you're bold enough to, to even mention it and say it. And I think it's yeah. I think it's if it's politics, if it's if it's religion, whatever it is, Christianity. A lot of us, our, our men, and I love what you said. Our men have to stand up, have to really stand up and take charge and and really take um, ownership. Hey, Roger, would you guys agree? In terms of ownership, in terms of okay, come on, let's um, let's um, do this in terms of social change. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of it, like you're saying, the onus comes back on us as, as men. To really lead and, and to find the solutions, also. But, um, but yeah, man, that's, that's some deep so. stuff. Mm. So um, yeah, we're gonna get cancelled um, next week. <laughs> <laughs> we get cancelled. It's too much. Sunday at one part. Week. Please, <laughs> please don't cancel mandate. I don't mind. I don't mind being cancelled. I've already been cancelled, but please don't cancel mandate. I mean, and I honour the work that you guys are doing. I think you guys are working in a critical space. Hey, when it works, when it comes to equipping and, and enabling and encouraging our men. I think that's a wonderful space, especially around, and again, I, I said it before, it's the hearts and minds of mm. people, but the hearts and minds of men, and I know what changed my heart and my mind, Hey, but and this might not be the thing that that, that, that is the answer for that person. I believe it's the answer for everyone, but that's my own view. <laughs> uh, but I think for me, look, I acknowledge all of the issues, and there's no perfection in this. Hey, then none of this is easy. Mm. Like, I might, I, might, I might be up here thinking, well, that what a dickhead. He's just saying, well, that, that's easy as, he's got a law degree, blah, blah, blah. Actually, man, I... I Man, I live, I mean, live, you used, hey, every, that's the buzzword, lived experience. Everyone talks, I came through this whole journey. We came through the state house and the violence and I've got all the risk factors that you want to talk about, but I don't want to blame the system and I don't want to blame the narrative and anyone else. I actually want to see, take responsibility for my own problems, my own sin and work on it and bring that to this book and bring that to the one that wrote this book. But I think for you guys that are working in the space and the, the men that are listening, man, I hope this does challenge you. And if you disagree with me, good, because mm. we need men that think. We need yeah, men that yeah. would rationally, logically think through an issue, not just be spoon-fed something and said, well, that's what the, the, the MP said, that's what the faith fair said. I want, I want to see men think. When I catch up with my boys, eh, they don't have the degrees that I have, but these dudes are street smart. 
hey, I'd rather be street smart than book smart any day. And I talk with my boys, I talk with the guys I grew up with, and the wisdom and the the laughter, the mocking, the teasing, that's the stuff that, that that's the richness. And we don't agree with everything. There's a bunch of my boys that hate God. There's a bunch of my boys that think I'm an idiot. Hey, but that's all good because we're still boys and we love each other. But I'd rather see men think about an issue rather than just give up in their hearts and minds. I'd rather see them wrestle and try and, and you don't need to have degrees to do that. You know what I mean? Like I think, and that's why I think your work is absolutely critical. So God bless you guys and your work because the more you talk about this stuff, the more you you verbalize, think, rationalize, logically attack these things. I think the more, the more, uh, the more change, the real, real more impact that we really start seeing in the families, eh? rather than hiding these issues down. So, man, oh man, awesome. Any any last questions, um, Usuls? Nah, I think that that was pretty good for me. I mean, the only thing I was curious about was sort of, I mean, you sort of touched on it before about the history and. Uh, the context of time and the way society's changed, the um, the state of technology and how that's affected things now, um, but also just thinking about you know some of the statistics statistics you talked about with um, churchgoers and things, and I just wonder in your mind with the way that society's trending versus the values that you live by. Um, I mean, it seems obvious that things will get worse before it gets better, um, and so I just wonder for those who maybe don't believe um you know what would you recommend to keep the hope alive um yeah yeah i, th- I think um i i don't know if it's going to be it's going to get worse for everyone mm. i think it's going to get worse in our country for those that carry certain views and certain mm. world views i think we live in a society that's increasingly anti anti god or hostile to god and even apathetic to God. So for those that hold that kind of worldview or perspective, I think things will get tougher for them. But I think for others, you know, it's just going to be life as usual, I think. I think that's that's the, that's the reality that I'm starting to see uh, moving back to New Zealand. But I think for those that are lacking hope, and, and again, I still think this is the most amazing hope that is available in the person of Christ, but I, but I think for me, it's finding out what are those places that you can find that strength and hope in. And I've, I've seen pe- find, people find that in their culture, um, which I, again, have questions about at times. I've seen people find it in sports and, and, and you know, doing seven challenges and Tabata and hit and, and you know, and then, look, if that's your thing and that brings your hope and your joy and man, so be it, I think. But, but I guess what I'm saying, Jay, is we can f- try and address the cosmetic stuff. We can try and dress the, the the external stuff of our body and, and and our education, our jobs and stuff. But again, it's the hearts and minds mm. for me. And what is the place that really helps you bring strength in terms of that heart and mind? And look, I I won't apologize. I I, I won't back down for the fact that for me, this is the ultimate uh, game changer in the hearts and minds of of people is is uh, the Holy Scriptures and and the person of Christ. But if that's not you, then then I hope. Then my ch- my encouragement would be to find out where that place is that would help strengthen the heart and mind, your own your own heart and your mind. Does that make sense? Yeah, hey? yeah, so, yeah, and and sense. and for a lot of my boys who aren't believers, who aren't Christians, <laughs> we often find that just in catching up, you know, just in talking, just in mocking and laughing, and then, you know, sort of crying and and all that kind of stuff. And so I think that helps, even though they don't carry the same world view mm. as me, but that hopefully helps bring some of that strength and stability that um, that we all need in life. Eh? So that's my my attempt to try and address that. Yeah, Not everyone shares my world view, and I'm used to that, yeah. but I'm willing to stand on my world view, and I think everyone should be willing to stand on theirs. Mm. Yeah, yeah uh, just for me, I just wanted to thank you um, for the work that you do. Thank you for making yourself um, available to um, the table, to the conversations and to our audience. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, um, you spoke at a, a Swissy and Why Was conference. Oh, yeah, I remember yeah, that. Yeah, and um, you were one of the electors and what stood out for me, because me being from Southside, me being who I am, growing up in the hood, um, you had... You know, you tatted up, beard, cheese cutter, and you were duckied up, but you were um, really intelligent, and you had and you spoke about your worldview and what shapes it. And you, 
I think you triple major. Yeah, uh, th- three degrees, but doesn't get me to heaven. But three degrees. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, anyway. that, three. when you had shared that, it really inspired me because I resonated to the story, um, just just by the you know you being you. Mm. Um, didn't have to wear a suit or anything. It was like, oh, shucks. Couldn't fit anyway, like though. <laughs> <laughs> this guy's like me. And it really inspired me in terms of like my aspirations and my journey of like education, even though I hate it. But it was like, man, if you can do it, I can do it. So I just really wanted to honor you in that space. And, and while we got you here, are you able to, because we know you've got a podcast as well. Oh, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah, well, well they're gonna cancel that now. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, look, no, no, hey, also, um, again, uh, yeah, we do have a podcast. It's a, it's just this a small minty one at the back there, but it's called Fresh Truth. But it's part of a ministry that just wants to stand for biblical truth, uh, and so we're we're really blunt about our worldview. Hey, you know what I mean? And so, but we do it from a Basfika Polynesian angle. That's the fresh part of the word, and then the truth part is the biblical truth, and and we want to try and offer perspectives, you know, a biblical perspective on gender the sexuality on 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 LGBT on all the major you know key things that our society is facing um, but we're upfront about that so look it's you can find it on the normal places but I think um, it's just an attempt from a group of South Auckland brothers uh, who don't know much but who know that they're saved by grace so yeah so fresh truth um, that's us um, and we've been blessed and I can't wait to see you guys on fresh truth to, <laughs> to, to so we can all get cancelled <laughs> <laughs> nah, but yeah, yeah, praise the Lord. <laughs> My Lord, also, thanks, bro. Oh, man. Oh, man. Ron, you, thank you so much, also. Thank you for tonight. Thank you for coming out and sharing and f- and for your boldness. I think you yeah, thank you so much for your, your courage, also, for, for just sharing and um, but also being honest and, and, and open about what, what we're coming talking about. Uh, but um, also, mandate is, is, is really about uh, encouraging men, encouraging men to, to push the envelope or to push the boundaries in terms of um, being purpose driven. Um, and living life to the fullest, and I love the fact that you, you know, you don't you don't shy away from your belief in in in, uh, in God. Uh, but bro, it's been really enlighten, enlightening. Also, uh, just really blessed to, to have you on tonight. And um, you know, as always, every, every guest that comes on, we always give them a, a gift. And so, likewise, we want to give you a gift as well. Oh, are Lord, thank you. Uh, also, so, so this is for you. Is this for my campaign? Or is this <laughs> 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 from the suit, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Is this the suit that Charles was talking about? Are they off you, bro? Are they off you? Uh. So, also, this is, um, yeah, this is a, oh, me. Yeah, we always do a bit of a caricature uh, for all our guests, and this is for, for you. And so, what we've done, I, I depict you as. Um, as a kind of like a, a forerunner sharing the gospel. Oh, he looks skinny. So that, I'll take the photo. I'll take it. I'll take it. Yeah, you're all good. Forerunner, yeah, it's kind of like oh, um, mean. John the Baptist. And so we, I believe in the work that you do. I'm 100% um, Ronji. And so this is for you. So um, bless you and thank you for for coming on mandate. Uh, oh, yeah, this, praise this, the Lord. This is for you. So thank you so much. Ale lofa, taile lofa. This is mean. Yeah, it took me all night to. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can tell. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, so I need yeah. to go get my line in my hair again. So. <laughs> I look like your Fessel Collins. Anyway, that's a different, that's a different story. So we're, Fessel, yeah, yeah, yeah. you're mixed. <laughs> now nah, put me, put me with Fess and we'll see. Yeah, what, yeah, yeah, yeah. See what happened. Nah, nah. And I love my also. We used to own a business together. Yes, so yes. we back in the day. And so he's done really well. But yeah, I just wanted to uh, I say please, please. thank you. Uh, it's been a real joy just hanging out with you men and um, and the mandate crew and stuff like that. It's just been a real blessing. I do hope it's useful. Look, I. Um, I pray that it's um, useful not just for you guys. It's cool to chill, but for those that are listening and watching, and it's okay to disagree me, disagree yeah, with yeah. me if you do. But I'm happy to talk about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, at the same time, as Paul says in Romans, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew and then to the Gentile. So I stand unashamed in that in that worldview, and I and I'm willing to live my life for it and also give my life for it. Mm. Awesome. And so I'm um, happy to talk to your people if people disagree or whatever, but I've been really, really blessed. So for time, I'll have a note. And thank you for the gift. This is cool. So God oh, bless. Man, thank you also. Hey, but can you do one more thing for us also? We started off in prayer. So if we give you the, the uh, you could just um, bless us uh, ending oh. in prayer also. Oh, cool. Thanks all source. Oh, well, let us pray. Uh, Father says in uh, Psalms 115, not unto us, not unto us, but unto your name alone be the glory. As Jude writes uh, in Jude uh, 1 uh, verse 25, To the only wise God be glory and majesty, and dominion and power, now and forevermore. And so we thank you for this chance to chat with the also's blessed them and their families and the mandate crew and all the people that are listening and 
and all the people that are going to send hate mail and all that kind of stuff. Lord, just thank you for the chance just to chill and, and talk about these things and talk about society. Lord, if, if I've fallen short, forgive me. Uh, but Lord, we thank you for your goodness and your grace. And again, not unto us, not unto us, but unto your name alone be the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Fessel, he called you out, so you're up next also. Jump on before you come mere, Sully, because then you're going to forget all the South Aucklanders. <laughs> Mandate.